Thank you very much, sir. Um, so today's briefing should last approximately 30 minutes. Um, today we have Resolute Support Mission Missions Duty Commander, Lieutenant General Richard Cripwell of Great Britain, uh, to provide an update on RS's train, advise, and assist mission. And with that, sir, um, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much indeed. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. And I should just confirm that I'm the deputy commander of RS, not the duty commander. I'm not aware that there is such a position. Uh, but I'm privileged today to be representing the NATO-led Resolute Support Mission, and I'm delighted to have the chance to give you an update on the situation here in Afghanistan. I know last week that you heard from the US SFAB commander, Colonel Jackson, who gave you a focus on activity at the tactical level. My intention is to speak to you about the ceasefire, first of all, at least to the extent that I can from a Resolute Support perspective and then to take the opportunity as a non-US officer to give you an insight into the work of the 39 nation coalition, training, advising and assisting to ensure that Afghanistan's security institutions are fit for the future. So turning first to the ceasefire, we saw some remarkable scenes here over the weekend. For the first time in a generation, the government of Afghanistan and the Taliban participated in a ceasefire over Eid, one that was observed by both sides. You'll have seen the pictures of Afghan soldiers and Taliban fighters embracing and shaking hands, and government representatives and Taliban leaders were seen praying together. Although the Taliban ceasefire has now ended, President Ghani's decision to extend the government ceasefire and reiterate his offer of unconditional talks shows just how serious the desire for peace is here in Afghanistan. Your own Secretary of State, Secretary Pompeo, was the first to declare support for the President's offer. We are, of course, disappointed that the Taliban decided not to continue and chose instead to return to war. But we are fully behind the Afghan government and resolute support will continue to honour the government's ceasefire as long as it endures. Now to turn to the Resolute Support mission itself. You will, I hope, be familiar with the three pressures that President Ghani believes will ultimately bring the Taliban to the table. Social pressure, which is clearly growing in the run-up to the election. Diplomatic pressure from NATO, the UN and the entire international community. And lastly, military pressure. And Resolute Support is squarely focused on the latter pressure. But NATO isn't here to do this ourselves. As I intimated earlier, our focus is on building capability to ensure that the Afghan security forces can deliver effective, targeted military pressure to protect and secure their population and to create the conditions for an inclusive political settlement. We are doing that through the Train Advise Assist mission and are supporting our Afghan counterparts at every level. We are helping at the most senior levels, what I would like to call institutional development. We have resolute support military advisors meeting regularly with Afghan leaders in the Ministry of Defense, the Ministry of Interior and the National Security Council, helping to deliver reform, to tackle corruption and to make tough decisions in the interests of national security. We are also helping at the structural level to fundamentally redesign and to produce a different sort of army, one that is capable, one that is professional, and in the long run, one that is affordable for the Afghan government. With support from Resolute Support, old leaders have been retired and, placed and replaced with younger, more capable officers, promoted on merit and rigorously held to account for their leadership ability. My own country, the United Kingdom, along with Denmark, Australia and New Zealand oversee, for example, the training of over a thousand new officers, male and female, per year at the Afghan National Army's Officer Academy. And then finally, as you heard last week, we're also helping at the tactical level, supporting the ANDSF on the ground. You heard about the impact the SFAB had, as I said, 
but we are also mentoring the Afghan Air Force, which is becoming more capable and more professional by the day, providing support to the Afghan ground forces. Our seven Resolute Support Commands, four of them led by the US and the remaining three by Germany, Italy and Turkey, provide the same mentorship at the core level, ensuring the best possible leadership and decision making. I've seen for myself how resilient the security forces now are, despite the challenging circumstances they find themselves in. So far this year, they have defended over 80% of the district centres attacked by the enemy. They're getting better all the time, they are more resilient, and at the highest levels, they are clear on how they see their future. All of this is delivered through a true team effort in a coalition of 39 nations. Even the newest member of NATO, Montenegro, assists with the protection of advisers in the north of the country and has done for many years. I clearly don't have time this morning to mention every ally and partner, but the collective effort is considerable, enduring and beneficial to the long-term development of government institutions and the security forces themselves. Right now, I truly believe that we stand on the edge of opportunity here in Afghanistan. There are clear signs of change. We've seen the first Eid ceasefire since 2001. The security forces, army and police, are more capable, more professional, and are better led than ever before. The country is preparing for national parliamentary and next year presidential elections, which in turn will give a clear voice to the Afghan people who are clearly committed to peace. International support for resolute uh, support remains strong. NATO is increasing the mission by 3,000 troops this year. And the NATO summit in Brussels in three weeks' time will be the opportunity to again publicly declare the long-term commitment of the coalition in both funding and in military capability to the future of this mission. I firmly believe that the continued commitment of all 39 nations in concert with the South Asia strategy is working, but it is also clear that we have to stay the course. To provide some sense of the work that the coalition is doing, perhaps on a more broad level than you have heard before. We are clear that resolute support is here to help the Afghans to deliver the military pressure that brings the Taliban to the table. The ways in which we do that are varied, through institutional development, through our advisors to the Afghan government, through our assistance to reforming the Afghan police and army, and right down to tactical advice and support from our troops in the field. We all believe here that Afghanistan and all of its citizens deserve security and a lasting peace. And with that, ladies and gentlemen, I'm very happy to take your questions. All right, so ladies and gentlemen, before we get started for all questions, uh, please provide full name and your agency. We'll allow everyone to have up to two follow-ups for each question. Um, and the first one, uh, we'll bring it uh, for Reuters. Okay. Sure, uh, Idris from Reuters here. Uh, question about the ceasefire. Um, now that the Taliban obviously uh, carried out an attack, do you still seem optimistic that it, you know, it could work in the future. Do you expect the Taliban to sort of come back to the table or, I mean, how do you see this playing out? Because the optimism's there, but I'm not seeing um, the Taliban re-engaging in any way um, in any sort of ceasefire in the future. Ed, thanks very much indeed for that question. Um, as for what can happen in the future, clearly I don't have a crystal ball for that, but I cannot understate the sense of optimism uh, that is uh, in the country at the moment. The president made an extraordinarily courageous uh, statement of ceasefire before Eid. Uh, that was <clears throat> matched uh, by, in a sense, their own statement from the Taliban. And the scenes here in Kabul would certainly give anybody uh, hope that uh, the ceasefire uh, is possible in the future. Right, but the scenes in Western Afghanistan, I think, where 30 soldiers were killed would probably sort of shatter that optimism. What is your optimism based on? Is, uh, other than this three-day ceasefire, is there anything else beyond that that sort of uh, gives you a sense of optimism? 
I think it's not just the, uh, the, the ceasefire, but the manner in which it played out over the weekend. It really was extraordinary uh, to see the Taliban laying down their uh, weapons, uh, coming into Kabul, uh, intermingling with the security forces. Uh, we know that there were governors going to uh, prayers with Taliban uh, leaders. Uh, these things would have been unimaginable uh, only a week ago, and I think it's scenes like that that give us optimism for the future. I think there was a story um, out, out of the region that we did citing officials saying they were actually concerned that the Taliban coming into the centers and the cities had given them an opportunity to scope out targets and it was actually that's why they were in the cities. Have you seen any sort of intelligence reporting on that? No, I've seen no reporting on, uh, you know, I've seen the reports uh, in the media and so on, but I've seen no reports of military-like activity. Uh, candidly, the Taliban that came into Kabul on Saturday seemed to be more focused on taking selfies, going to the barber, buying ice cream and things like that. I saw no evidence of any other military activity. All right, for the next question, we'll go to uh, Military Times. Thank you, um, Tarakat Military Times. Just to follow up on Idris's question, you know, how can the Taliban be serious about your sense of optimism, you know, if they follow up immediately with this type of attack? How do you balance those two statements? I'm not going to speak to the Taliban's sense of optimism or anything else. All I can tell you is what I see. I see enormously courageous steps by, taken by the government of Afghanistan uh, to bring about a peace in their country and one which we are fully supportive. What the Taliban do is a matter for them. Okay, and then uh, as a follow-up, um, you know, with, with the NATO summit coming in a matter of weeks, you know, you described this uh, time as the edge of opportunity. What additional things do the NATO contributing nations need to do militarily to make this edge different than other times of optimism over the last 17 years? I don't think uh, uh, we need to do anything differently. I think that the mission that Resolute Support has has been a critical factor in bringing about a ceasefire. Our job here is to build up the capability of Afghan forces. Uh, Chairman Dunford, just as one, has stated that the forces are here that are required to do the job. And our job here is to make sure that we continue to do the work uh, this, that this coalition has uh, continued to do for many years and which has clearly brought the, uh, an extra sense of professionalism and resilience to the security forces. As a last follow-up, so going into the summit, there wouldn't be any additional asks or requests for resources you need or personnel or a type of military capability? Well, it, I'm not going to uh, pass any requests to the summit uh, through this medium. It is a matter for the commanders here to make their recommendations to the military leaders, and I'll leave it up to the, uh, the leaders at the summit to decide how they can best support the mission. All right. With that, we'll move forward to AP. Uh, thank you, General. This is Bob Burns with Associated Press. <clears throat> I wonder if you think there's merit to the argument that the Afghan government ceasefire now that the Taliban is not participating, um, simply gives time and space for the Taliban to regroup and to regain uh, military advantage. Bob, thanks very much indeed. As I said in my opening remarks, it's clearly disappointing that the Taliban have decided not to extend their ceasefire. Uh, but the fact remains nothing in the president's ceasefire means that the security forces cannot act in self-defense and that they can't act to stop any military activity. Uh, they are not defenseless as a result of their ceasefire in any way. And if the Taliban choose to carry out military activity, uh, the Afghan security forces are going to stop it. As, as a follow-up, General, the argument recently prior to the ceasefire was that what, one of the major differences recently was that the Afghans were on the offensive and that this was a major change. Uh, now they're not on the offensive almost by definition with a, with a ceasefire. So doesn't that, isn't that a setback in some sense for the, uh, the equation with the Taliban? 
Uh, no, I don't, I don't think it is. I mean, mil as I said, military pressure is also just one of the pressures that are being applied to the Taliban. Uh, it is clear uh, from events over the weekend, from the peace marches, from the peace movement, that there is a growing social pressure against the Taliban. And the, the scenes that we saw over the weekend are further evidence of that. There's been an extraordinary outpouring of support from around the world and particularly around the region in support of the ceasefire. Uh, and I d certainly don't see the Afghan security forces at a disadvantage uh, because their presence has taken the courageous move to declare a ceasefire. As I say, they retain, as we do, the right of self-defense and they retain the rights to stop military activity as and when they see it. With that, uh, we'll go on to our next question for uh, NBC. Thank you, sir, for doing this today. Um, what's your sense of uh, where the Afghan government, um, what's their feeling towards after the, uh, the Taliban uh, stopped the, uh, the, the, the ceasefire? Uh, thanks for the question, but I, I'm afraid you're going to have to ask the Afghan government that question. Uh, clearly, there is a huge sense of achievement in the government over what was achieved for the weekend. But as for their reactions since then, you're going to have to put that to the government information spokesman. No other follow-up with that one. Go ahead, sir. I'm sorry. Hi, uh, it's Jamie McIntyre with the Washington Examiner. Those of us who've been around long enough remember 50 years ago when the United States uh, strategy in Vietnam was to inflict so much pain on the Viet Cong that they would be driven to the peace uh, table. Uh, ultimately, the U.S. discovered there was no amount of pain that they could inflict that would break the will of the Viet Cong. Now we see the strategy that you're talking about, about uh, uh, putting military pressure on the Taliban. What signs do you see, what evidence do you have that the Taliban is going to be susceptible to that pressure, that it will in fact, uh, change the dynamic. Well, thanks for the question. Uh, the, um, I think the signs have been clear over the last few years. You know, the NATO Resolute Support Mission, through train, advise and assist, has been developing the capability of the security forces. Um, they, as I said in uh, my early remarks, the army is more resilient, it is better led, it is better equipped, it is more professional. Uh, the Afghan Air Force is growing uh, at a significant rate uh, and as you'll be aware from comments that General Nicholson has made, the commandos have doubled in size. This is the force that ensured last year that the Taliban achieved none of their strategic objectives. Uh, and this is the force that has brought the Taliban to a ceasefire this year. I have great faith uh, in the Afghan forces and I can see uh, from the work that we do with them uh, just how much better they're getting all the time. This is their fight. I'm not going to comment on American strategies from the past. Uh, we are supporting a nation that wishes to fight its enemies and this is their fight and their strategy. Uh, if I can just follow up, it may be that the Afghan forces are more capable and are able to uh, conduct more effective operations. But what evidence is there that the Taliban isn't just ready and willing to just keep fighting indefinitely, as it has in the past, whether or not it's winning uh, tactical victories on the battlefield? I think the Taliban statements themselves of this year point to the fact that they are looking for a different outcome than just fighting for the rest of the year or the years. Their letter to the people of America in, in February of this year, the wording of the al Kandak uh, announcement at the start of the fighting season makes it clear that they wish to see uh, an end to this war as well. With that, we'll go on for Anadolu. General, thanks for doing this uh, Castle Media with Anadolu Agency. Um, as much as you know, does the Af Afghan government speak to Taliban as a whole organization or they are speaking with different factions within the Taliban separately because we hear that some of the violations continues despite these talks? Uh, thank you very much indeed for the question. I have no idea whether the government of Afghanistan is talking to the Taliban. Uh, I, I really can't add any more to that. I just don't know. 
Uh, for our next question, we'll go to Fox. General Lucas Tomlinson, Fox News. Just to follow up on Bob's question, can you rule out that the Taliban used this three-day ceasefire to restage their operations and launch this attack in Baghdad? Uh, Lucas, uh, uh, I, I kind of go back to the answer I gave before. I, I've seen uh, no suggestion that the Taliban were using the Eid ceasefire to in some way improve or redistribute their military capability. Yesterday on Capitol Hill, a U.S. Senator Elizabeth Warren said that there have been so many statements by American generals over the years about turning the corner, or as you said today, this edge of opportunity, that the policy is going in circles. Can you respond uh, to that comment, General? Thanks for the question, but I, I, I'm very happy that General Miller responded to that question uh, at the Armed Services hearing. And, and with that, we'll go on uh, CNN and then we'll go on Wash, Wall Street Journal. Hello, General. Uh, Ryan Brown, CNN. Uh, thank you for doing this. Um, I did have a question. You, you mentioned how the increased resiliency of the ANA and you talked a little bit how they're being better led. Can you, are there any metrics you could talk a little bit about what, what makes you see these, what improvements you're actually seeing? I mean, this, the attrition rate seems pretty high still in this recent attack, you know, reports of 30. So what, what are some of the metrics you're seeing? Uh, and in, in addition to that, I think I heard you say the commandos have been doubled, but that's planned to double them, right? They actually haven't been doubled at this time. Thank you. Thanks. No, you're absolutely right, and, 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 and I'm glad to have the chance to clear that up. The, the, the plan is to double the commandos. Uh, as for the, uh, the resilience, uh, I, as I mentioned in my opening statement, uh, over 80% on 80% uh, of attacks on district centres have been pushed back. Uh, we saw earlier this year and last year uh, just how more resilient the army has been. Uh, but I don't deny that the level of casualties in the army is worrying. General Nicholson has spoke to this in the past. Uh, and we remain keen in particular to uh, change the tactic of the uh, Afghan army and their reliance on checkpoints, which is as much a social issue as, is, as, is, as it is a military issue. As for the metrics to judge leadership, if you like, um, those, are, those are many and various, uh, but we go to significant lengths uh, to make sure that the army, uh, particularly these days, are selecting officers on merit, who have proven themselves at lower ranks in the field uh, to make sure that they are being uh, as trained as the best of our ability uh, in leadership and in command. Uh, and we see those results in the field. And have you seen any decrease in the casualty rate uh, since this new strategy has kind of been unveiled as the, and more advisors are going to the Kandak level and the brigade level? Have you seen any effect on the number of casualties uh, being suffered by the ANA? or A&P also? Uh, I, honestly, I, I, don't have the, uh, I don't have the detail of that. Uh, clearly, uh, the Afghan forces are being much more offensive than they have been in the past. All seven corps uh, are engaged in operations now. Uh, their brigades uh, routinely, uh, they have three of their four brigades engaged in operations. And it's just the nature of war that there will be casualties as a result of that action. But I don't have any details. Thank you. Uh, with that, Wall Street Journal. Hi, General. Uh, how are you? It's Gordon Newbold from the Wall Street Journal. Um, we've been hearing a lot about uh, peace talks and reconciliation. I wonder if you could expand a little bit on how you characterize where that is, assuming it's still kind of uh, in its nascency. Um, and also, uh, could you talk to us about uh, the idea of American, uh, the, about the U.S. leading direct negotiations with the Taliban, which, you know, up until now had always been an Afghan-led affair? Yeah, good morning, Gordon. Good to hear from you. Um, I'll tackle the second one first, because, uh, which I can do very simply, because it would simply be inappropriate of me to uh, discuss what the United States may or may not do. I, I don't wish to be uh, swerving away from the question, but it's simply not uh, for me to talk about that. 
Uh, as for talks and reconciliation, as I said to one of your colleagues earlier, I'm not aware of the government talking to the Taliban. Uh, but we have seen through the course of this year uh, and last year um, uh, individuals and groups of Taliban who are seeking to reconcile. Uh, that's all over the country, but I particularly note in the West, uh, in Herat and in Baghdis, we have seen uh, groups of Taliban who have been coming in, uh, who want to reconcile with the government and with the governors. Uh, and I think uh, the way in which that process is happening provides a model for the rest of the country. Is, is that, though, you know, onesies, twosies, kind of an interesting development? Or do you think that there is, like, the beginning of what could be some momentum on that front? Uh, there is certainly, I think, momentum over in the West, notwithstanding the recent attacks. I think there is momentum over there. Uh, I would imagine that as a result of the scenes over the weekend, there are questions being asked in the Taliban uh, about uh, asking themselves the same questions. I, I, I'm not going to overplay what's happening in the West, but it is clear uh, whether people are reconciling or whether they are investigating the possibility of that is clear that there is a movement. Uh, over the weekend, we saw, as I said, uh, Taliban and security force together. Uh, Taliban leaders have been having discussions and continue to do so with uh, governors. So I think this is, um, I, I wouldn't overplay what's happening in the West, but I do think it's start of something. Wait, but there's no way to kind of quantify it or characterize it in a way that would help kind of better help us to better understand kind of the the uh, nature of it is there unfortunately I don't think there is a better way to characterize it this isn't a movement uh, but it is clear that it's something that is being discussed and in some cases is happening and we'll continue to monitor that and, and continue to look to the Afghan government to support that process sir Hi, sir. Jim Garamon with uh, DOD News. We talk about the Taliban, or all many people talk about the Taliban, as if it's some sort of a monolithic organization. It's more a confederacy, and I'm wondering if there is a difference among these groups throughout the region, and if it would be possible to perhaps get some of these groups in other areas more apt to uh, to uh, discuss uh, reconciliation than in others. Uh, your is what's your take on it, uh, Jim? Thanks for the question. Uh, I, I, you know, I I hear your premise, and it's clear from the way in which the Taliban uh, started their ceasefire that the the organisation as a whole. Uh, clearly accepted the direction that they were given by their leadership. Uh, as I as I said, the Taliban around the country are exploring ways in which to uh, move forward from that ceasefire. So in that sense, I guess you could say that there is a disparate nat uh, nature to the organization. Jim, you're good with that one. Uh, and so we've got time for one final question. Go ahead, Jim. Thank you, General. Thanks very much for doing this. Jeff Selden from VOA. You mentioned how some Taliban were, are exploring and more open to the possibility of, of reconciliation. We heard several months ago from Afghan officials that Taliban leadership was actively trying to do things to prevent that. How strong has that snapback been? Have there been more reports of families of, of Taliban fighters or commanders being held hostage, essentially? And also, to what extent, you mentioned the optimism, but to what extent is, are the other efforts that are necessary, the diplomatic efforts, some of the other efforts that go along with the military efforts, keeping pace with what you've been able to achieve militarily with the Afghan forces? Thanks for that. Uh, as for a snapback, I, 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 I don't think I can talk to that, but uh, clearly, uh, between the events of Saturday that we saw all over the country uh, and to the fact that that was significantly reduced on the Sunday, suggests that uh, at least somebody wasn't keen to see Taliban fighters 
uh, taking selfies and eating ice cream in Kabul. Um, more broadly, I think diplomatic pressure uh, and social pressure is hugely important. I think the speed with which Secretary Pompeo uh, came out in support of the extension of the ceasefire uh, uh, the other night was hugely important. I think the way in which countries in the region, uh, which the United Nations and other organizations have, sh have demonstrated their support for the actions that the government has taken. Uh, and just to reinforce the social pressure, it is clear again from around the country how people embrace the notion of peace, of not fighting, uh, the way in which the uh, progress in the elections is coming and how much they look forward to expressing their view and to having a role in the future of their country. So that all of the pressures have a vital role to play in bringing peace to this country. Okay. Well, thank you all for your questions. Uh, that's all the time we have here. Uh, sir, are there any final words you'd like to, for this group, sir? Uh, no, I'd just like to, again, uh, thank you for your questions. Uh, we didn't perhaps get to quite the detail of train, advise and assist that uh, I think uh, this mission uh, is so focused on, which is at the heart of the, uh, the capability development of the armed forces. But I would like to, to reinforce to you that it is the work that the 39 nations do here uh, to build the capability uh, not just of the forces, but of the institutions uh, that is at the heart of the success of the security forces, which is at the heart of bringing about a ceasefire uh, recently and which will be at the heart of providing security and peace for the people of this country. And thank you very much. Okay, uh, thank you for your time. If there are any additional questions, I'll take them and coordinate directly with uh, Lieutenant General Kirkwell's staff. Sir, thank you again. My pleasure. Thank you very much indeed.